All right, music fans, welcome. Harmless Dave here talking real music in real time for real people just like you right there and just like me right here. So the Monkees have called it quits after a little 55-year run um, starting back in 1966 and um, finishing up at the Greek Theater out in Los Angeles where both uh, Mickey Dolenz and uh, Michael Nesmith along with their fantastic band, uh, ran through a whole bunch of nostalgia, great songs, concluding, of course, with their signature song, I'm a Believer, which um, really made me kind of a believer as a kid, I guess, as far as, is this a good thing to listen to? Whether some people feel the monkeys were just the prefab four, they're this manufactured band. Well, guess what? they were manufactured really, really well. And a lot of people won't acknowledge that. There's always this argument that the producers, the whole Don Kirshner empire back in the 60s there, uh, these guys were too controlling and heavy handed, but they made a lot of real good decisions, especially with the music. Uh, you've got these amazing songwriters and amazing musicians uh, who showed up to put these songs together uh, and using vocals from Davy Jones. Basically, everybody gets to sing at some point, although your true lead singer here is Mickey Dolenz and his voice, by the way, just still really incredible. Even now, I mean, the guy just has a great range. I guess guys named Mickey, there's probably something going on there in the water, but um, he's just really good. And uh, he's a great performer. Um, he became the face of the Monkees, I think, more so when the Monkees made their comeback in the 1980s. But Davy Jones was there and Peter Tork was there. Uh, Michael Nesmith, you know, he's always been a little bit aloof and apart at times because I think <clears throat> it may have taken him a little while to accept his place. You know, when you're typecast into a role and maybe you don't deserve that because Michael Nesmith is this great songwriter. Um, he jump-started Linda Ronstadt's career um, and he's written a lot of great songs uh, both for the Monkees and as uh, a solo artist so he was a true singer-songwriter and a pretty decent instrumentalist uh, as long as you know he got to to play on something um, but this was the big argument back in the 60s. Should the boys get more control or, or should we keep, keep controlling them? Now, if they were controlled for a longer period of time, I don't know if they would have felt as though this was a real band. Um, and I'm talking about the people, you know, the, the actual monkeys themselves. Um, but because they were able to kind of wrestle control away and you know, they put out a couple of really decent albums um, using their own instincts and playing these songs. I heard they were having a lot of trouble recording that first album um, where they were just trying to do everything themselves. You had guys who had to learn how to play instruments and uh, it wasn't it wasn't pretty, but, you know, they they ended up doing it. And then they moved on, they moved forward, and then their chart success just kind of went away. Even Peter Tork in a documentary was like, hey, as soon as we went out on our own, you know, the hits stopped coming. And it's, it's sad because I think those guys were really good uh, and they still needed great songwriters. And Jerry Goff and Carole King, I mean, come on, how do you, you can't really beat that. Neil Diamond, Voice and Heart, these people were hired to create songs for the monkeys. Voice and Heart, especially, I think, kind of understood what the monkeys should sound like. And Neil Diamond, hey, he gives up one of his best songs ever. And it turns out it's kind of the signature song uh, of the monkeys. And then the song actually shows up 30 years later in a, in a Shrek movie. <laughs> so, I mean, the song had a lot of staying power. And I know Neil Diamond certainly gets some publishing and the royalties come in, but you know, that could have been a Neil Diamond number one song. Instead, it went to the monkeys and 
then those guys, along with Last Train to Clarksville, which was the Boys and Heart song, um, and so many other great songs on those albums, if you listen to them, you're going to find things you haven't heard before, and you're going to say, huh, this is some really good pop rock stuff. But um, people will argue, you know, is this a real band? They don't deserve the Hall of Fame because they're, they're not really a band. They're just a concept. And um, Mickey Dolan's like to argue that, you know, they were this make-believe band that turned into a real band. You know, like um, he always says, you know, it's like Leonard Nimoy actually becoming a Vulcan, which I don't know how that those two things go together. But, you know, it's like the actor who, who actually turns into the thing that he's trying to do. And I understand the monkeys probably always thought that, hey, I'm never going to get the street cred that real bands have. I mean, we're just kind of this fake version of the Beatles. John Lennon loved the monkeys, especially the television show, where he talked a lot about how they were uh, imitating Groucho Marx and they were doing all of this crazy slapstick and people needed to laugh. And that was a great format because you had the music and you had the comedy uh, and it was a little countercultural too. It was a few digs here and there, um, especially at authority figures, you know, and, and I really miss that about <laughs> the 60s in a way that they were always looking at the man with skepticism and with suspicion. And we don't do that anymore. We trust the man. The man is right. Just follow the man. Do the thing. Don't worry about the consequences. The man knows what's best for you. And even if it's kind of off topic, because I don't agree with all of the counter cultural things that happened in the 60s, but that spirit of kind of just pushing back, you know, don't trust anyone over 30, all that stuff. Um, I don't know, it doesn't really exist anymore. But the monkeys were the clean cut, supposedly, even though they did eventually get some pretty long hair on that show. Um, but that had nothing to do, they were clean cut, like the comedy, the music wasn't offensive. I mean, some of it got a little political, like Pleasant Valley Sunday. And there's some other songs that, you know, certain lyrics were trying to basically, again, sort of poke at the man. But overall, this was uh, music you could let your kids listen to. Um, and kids listen to it. And kids, when the monkeys went out there and tried to do a tour, I remember um, watching documentaries on this and the monkeys can't even hear themselves playing. It's much like what the Beatles had to do, right? So over the years, it's been just good nostalgia, good, clean fun. Like that song from, I think it's like 1969, one of their singles didn't do all that well. They were still releasing music right up until 1970 with, I think it was Jones. Jones and Dolans were left. Mickey Dolans is like, that's why I think he's like the, the torch bearer, you know, carrying the flag of the monkeys throughout everything. Uh, Davey was there technically too. Davey's not here anymore. Would have been awesome if the monkeys could have finished with all four original members on stage. But, you know, when you leave a band on these circumstances, I think people understand more than if people leave a band and they do so because of an argument or a disagreement. Uh, when you're no longer alive, then you can, you know, the, you can argue too that you really can't do this without Peter. You really can't do this without Davey. Um, they're both really important to this band. Uh, and maybe they should have just um, hung it up a number of years ago, but they did come out with an album. I think it was back in, I want to say 2016, 2017, which was really good, surprisingly good. And uh, a lot of outside songwriters, again, putting in their contributions and the results were really fantastic. Mickey Dolan's still a great singer at his age. And uh, even now just defies, uh, you know, genetics and logic and so forth. But um, kind of sad, <clears throat> the monkeys are done. And uh, that's your childhood. That's a lot of stuff kind of rolled into that. Um, you're never going to have anything really like the monkeys again. And that's one thing you have to think about that, even though they were this prefabricated band that was designed to tap into the whole hard day's night experience, they ended up being their own thing. And uh, 
There are four super talented guys. They really chose well. They couldn't pick David Crosby, apparently, or was it Stephen Stills? They couldn't pick Stephen Stills because the teeth weren't all where they were supposed to be or they weren't in good condition. Otherwise, it could have been Stephen Stills instead of uh, Michael Nesmith or Peter Tork. Uh, those four guys were just perfect, and it was destiny, and it was um, a divine appointment to be on that show. So anyway, so long, monkeys, and um, that's it. Done with this one. See you soon.